Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my loyal bed crimers, hello. Hope you guys are all doing well. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out the channel. All I ask is that after watching and or listening to the video, if you find you enjoyed it or learned something, do me a favor, smash the like button. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Those of you who've been following the Charlie Adelson case likely know who the main players are. We've got 47-year-old Charlie Adelson, his sister Wendy, Charlie and Wendy's parents, Donna and Harvey, and Wendy's ex-husband, the deceased Danny Markell. Tragically, Danny Markell was done in by thugs hired by Charlie Adelson and possibly by his mother, Donna, too. Donna was recently arrested and charged with first degree blank in connection with Danny Markell's death. While a lot of people may know elements about the crime, many may not know the backstory. Things like why Danny and Wendy's marriage imploded. So today I'm gonna fill in those blanks for you. Let's start with Donna and Harvey Adelson. Both of them grew up in New York City. Donna went to Queens College and became an elementary school teacher. Harvey graduated from the University of Buffalo before earning his Doctor of Medicine in Dentistry at Temple University. Donna and Harvey married in 1971, and eventually they decided to chuck the cold winter weather and they moved to South Florida. Donna left teaching at some point to help Harvey in his thriving dental practice. She also was a stay-at-home mom and she cared for their three children. Yes, there are three children in the Adelson family. The eldest is Robert, then came Charlie, and the baby of the bunch is Wendy. Fun fact for y'all, in 1986, Wendy was on the game show, The Weakest Link, and her mother Donna was also on a game show. She was on Wheel of Fortune. The same show that doomsday mom Lori Vallow was on. What is up with that? So the Adelson family lived in a five bedroom home in a quiet cul-de-sac in Coral Springs, Florida. And when Robert said he wanted to learn how to play tennis, Harvey and Donna had a tennis court installed in the backyard. Clearly Donna and Harvey were very involved with their children and they tried very hard to support all their interests. Good thing Robert didn't say he wanted to be a sumo wrestler. Just saying. Now, all three of the Adelson kids excelled in school. Wendy was even valedictorian of her high school class at Terra Vella High School in Coral Springs. Robert graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa, from Tulane, and he graduated with honors from the University of Florida's College of Medicine. The middle child, Charlie, attended the University of Central Florida, and he got a bachelor's degree in micro and molecular biology in 1999. He also received a degree in dentistry from Nova Southeastern University. Wendy studied peace and conflict at Brandeis University, where she graduated summa cum laude in 2001. Then she received her master's degree at the University of Cambridge in Britain. And then Wendy earned a law degree in 2006 from the University of Miami. So the Edelson children are all high achievers. They're all extremely bright. Now, for Donna and Harvey, the one thing that they really insisted on when it came to their kids was that they marry within their Jewish faith. The eldest, Robert, got into major hot water with mom and dad when he made the mistake of falling in love with an Indian American who practiced Hinduism. In an interview, Robert Adelson said that for years, 
His parents, Donna and Harvey, threatened to disown him if he married his Indian girlfriend, who, by the way, was also a doctor. Pressured beyond belief by the unrelenting Donna and Harvey, Robert eventually broke up with his Indian girlfriend. He then married a, quote, nice Jewish girl from Dallas. The problem was Robert was still pining for his Indian girlfriend, so he and his Jewish wife soon divorced, and actually I think their marriage was annulled. Robert quickly reunited with his former girlfriend, who miraculously took him back, and when he and she married, Robert was floored that his parents actually attended their traditional Hindu wedding. Apparently, Donna and Harvey tried to then heal the rift, but that wound never really scarred over. And today, Robert and his wife, who he's still married to, live near Albany, New York, but they have little contact with Donna and Harvey. Donna even said in one of her recent jailhouse calls with Charlie that she has one son who she doesn't speak with, and that is Robert. To me, he seems like the only Adelson who is very well adjusted and was able to break free from his overly controlling parents. Back now to Wendy and Dan Markell. According to Dan Markell's parents, Phil and Ruth Markell, Danny was ready to settle down and have kids when he met Wendy Adelson. Wendy was beautiful, and Ruth said that Wendy presented herself as a very warm person. I love the verb Ruth used there, presented herself. Danny and Wendy met on J-Date, which is a Jewish dating site. The rumor is that Wendy's mom, Donna, actually helped Wendy pick out Dan Markell, from the sea of potential suitors. Wendy is seven years younger than Danny, and when they met, Wendy was in law school at the University of Miami, and Danny was living in DC. Danny's family said that in the beginning, they had no doubts about Wendy. She was Jewish, she came from what appeared to be a very good family, her father was a dentist, her mom had been a teacher, yada, yada, yada. So the relationship between Wendy and Danny started off long distance, and in May of 2005, Danny accepted a tenured track position at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. So he was about to become a professor. During that same month, Danny and Wendy took a trip to Israel, and it was there that Danny proposed to Wendy and she accepted. They were, by all accounts, a charismatic duo. However, some of the couple's friends have said that there was always some drama in Danny and Wendy's relationship. One of the issues was that Danny loved to debate about any and all topics, and he didn't hold back, so sometimes it upset people. On one occasion, he got into it with one of Wendy's friends, and it got so bad that Wendy actually considered calling off her engagement. But perhaps the greatest drama of all occurred on their wedding day. You see, Dan had insisted on having a kosher menu. Now, for the wedding, the Adelsons and the Markells split the bill. And it just so happens that the Adelsons were in charge of the catering. And despite Danny's request for a kosher menu, the Adelsons deliberately didn't serve one. And this was very upsetting to Danny. Basically, he couldn't eat anything at his own wedding, nor could any of his guests who he knew had kosher diets. So he ran around to all of those guests he apologized profusely, and he said to them, please don't eat the food, it isn't kosher. Now, this should have been a huge red flag for Danny, but by now he was pretty much whipped, as they say, by Wendy. And despite the upset over the menu, Danny did not allow it to ruin his wedding. So right after he told the guests, hey, don't eat the food, he ran right back onto the dance floor and began dancing with his new bride, Wendy, once again. After the wedding and their club med 
honeymoon, Wendy and Danny went back to Tallahassee, Florida to start their married life. Wendy also got a teaching position at the University of Florida. Danny, by all accounts, was extremely proud of Wendy. And when they had their two baby boys, Danny was absolutely over the moon. He adored his sons and was very involved with them. One friend described Danny as being relentless with love, especially when it came to Wendy and to his two sons. So you can imagine how shocked Danny was when he was away on a short business trip to New York City for a conference and he gets a call from Wendy. She tells him she's leaving him. Well, Danny had no clue. There were no hints prior to this. So he leaves the conference immediately. He flies home. And as soon as he opens the front door, he's gobsmacked to find the home empty. Wendy's gone. His two baby sons are gone. Most of the furniture is gone. In the master bedroom, he discovers a stack of divorce papers from Wendy. Can you imagine? I cannot think of a greater betrayal than to have somebody pull this on you. And it came without warning. Now, I met another professor, which is kind of funny, who actually it's not funny. He had the same thing happen to him. He left to go to another town to go to a bookstore. And when he came home into his apartment, his wife was gone. And on the dining room table was a tiny little like, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a little Wiccan witchcraft thing. And his wife had left him. And let me tell you, it messed with him for many, many years. Now, Danny's parents arrived the next day for a visit. FYI, they live in Canada. Now, Danny was both devastated and furious. Wendy had sort of taken the coward's way out. She didn't confront him face to face. Prior to the divorce, Danny and Wendy had been hosting a lot of Shabbat dinners at their home. Shabbat dinners take place on Friday nights and they mark the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath. Now, prior to any talk of a divorce, some of the couple's friends say that they saw small cracks in the marriage. Danny and Wendy apparently fought over the household chores. Apparently, Danny wasn't the type of guy to mow the lawn or to clean the dishes. He maybe thought he was above that stuff. Being an intellectual, maybe he was more into his work and became very absorbed in it. So that was a problem. And also in the beginning of the marriage, Wendy was very careful about, about keeping a kosher home. But very soon into the marriage, Wendy started to break this rule, much to Danny's chagrin. Keeping a kosher kitchen and diet refers to things like what foods one can consume, how they're processed and how they're prepared. So Danny was 100% devoted to his Jewish heritage and religion, and clearly Wendy wasn't as into it. She didn't really care about eating kosher. At some point, Wendy started writing a novel, and she had a friend edit it. Their friend was surprised to see how much in the novel appeared to be autobiographical. Wendy had renamed Tallahassee in the novel, but it was pretty obvious that she was describing Tallahassee. Wendy described this place as being sort of backward with not too bright people living there. And she named her main character Lily, but it was pretty clear that the main character was based on Wendy. And by now, Wendy had realized she disliked Tallahassee. Although it's the capital of Florida, it's really pretty much a sleepy town. And she wanted to be in South Florida, closer to Miami, closer to her parents, and also closer to her brother, Charlie, with whom she was very close. Now in the novel, Lily describes feeling trapped, trapped in her town and trapped in her marriage. While Danny promoted the novel for his wife, he never read it. And this made Wendy feel highly disrespected. And by this point, Wendy had finally had enough of Tallahassee and enough of Danny. 
Right after Wendy left him, Danny sent an email to all of his friends. His advice to them in the email was to, quote, love mightily while you can, end quote. Dan at this point was a broken man. And get this, for two weeks after Wendy announced she wanted a divorce, she didn't tell Danny where she and the boys were. He had no clue. Now this to me spells absolute cruelty on Wendy's part. Those two boys were just as much his kids as they were Wendy's. So what right did she have to do this to him? Take his sons and not let him know where they were living. Despite this nasty treatment, Danny still hoped to woo Wendy back but it soon became apparent that that ship had sailed. She was done, and she wasn't coming back. And once Danny could see this, he went from being nice into fighting mode. He wasn't about to make things easy for Wendy, and he wasn't about to let her get away with keeping him from their children. Two, keeping a Holocaust diamond he'd shared with her during their marriage. Now, in case you haven't heard about this, a Holocaust diamond can be an heirloom diamond that somehow managed to evade the Nazis' detection. It can also refer to a diamond or other jewel that was stolen from a Holocaust victim by the Nazis. In Danny Markell's case, the diamond had belonged to his great aunt, and it was a two-carat diamond and he wanted it to remain in the family, which is only right when you're dealing with an heirloom like that. Wendy apparently didn't feel she needed to give it back to the Markels. And now I'm thinking, I hope that she didn't pawn it. That would be yet another cruel act inflicted on the Markels. But perhaps Danny's most daring chess move in his contentious lawyer against lawyer divorce were his court motions. In one of them, he asked that his mother-in-law, Donna, be forced to have supervision when she was in the company of Dan and Wendy's young boys. Danny had become aware that Donna was calling him names like stupid and saying that she hated him in front of his sons. Naturally, Danny feared that Donna's negative name-calling could eventually result in parental alienation if left unbridled. Donna was no doubt outraged by Danny's court motion, and of course this stirred up a lot of additional venom inside of her. The second move Danny made was to allege that Wendy had failed to disclose financial assets during the divorce wranglings, and if this was found to be true, Wendy could lose her law license, and thus her entire career. The stakes on that one were incredibly high. In fact, one could argue that that alone could be the motive for Dan Markell's death. I'm going to break up all this backstory into separate episodes, so I'm going to end this one here. In the next episode, we'll talk about the people that Wendy and Danny began dating after their divorce, and we'll also talk about what Danny was up to on the day of the crime. Hope you enjoyed this. See you next time on Bed Crime Stories. Now smash that like button.